Okay, that's better. I'd like to welcome everyone this morning to Greater Atlanta, Atlanta SDA Church. If you were with us this morning during Sabbath school, you saw how the Holy Spirit was working. Uh, the Holy Spirit moved mightily this morning. That is what, uh, that's our mission. Okay, that's our mission here, is not to come to church just to warm pews, but we come here to get energized, educated, and revigorated to go out in the world and spread the gospel. There's no seat, no, no pew warmers here. <laughs> if you want to warm the pews and just go home, sadly mistaken, you're at the wrong church. I'd like to thank everyone for making it here today. I pray for those that are on the way. I pray that they um, have safe traveling mercies as well. Thank you once again for being here. You could have chosen anywhere else to go, but you attend, uh, allowed the Holy Spirit to, you followed the Holy Spirit rather, and you came here. So I'd like to thank you and welcome you once again to Gre Greater Atlanta SDA Church. Now, our announcements are as follows. Our next board meeting will take place on Sunday October 20th at 11 a.m. Once again, that board meeting is Sunday, October 20th at 11 a.m. October birthdays, we have Tamika Utler, who is, whose birthday is October 13th. Have a special announcement that was passed off to me today. The evangelistic series at Newton County, day two will continue today, starting at 6 p.m. Like I said, this is day two. If you can support them, please do. It starts at 6.30 p.m. And tomorrow is their family fun day uh, that culminates their evangelistic series tomorrow, which is family fun day at Newton County Church as well. That starts at 12 noon. If you can make either or all, that would be helpful. And I'm sure that they would appreciate seeing us there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, opening prayer, if you stand, please. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I'd like to thank you for allowing us to see a week come and go, dear Lord. We have been beaten, battered, and bruised during the course of this week, dear Lord. But you allowed us to make it to your Sabbath, make it to see your Sabbath day, dear Lord. A day where we can put aside all earthly cares and concerns, dear Lord, and focus on you. I pray, dear Lord, that you continue to be with us during the Sabbath day, dear Lord, that we minister to others and that we spend this day with you, dear Lord. Ultimately, dear Lord, we'd like to ask you that this day be full of blessings. It started out with one, dear Lord, during Sabbath school. I pray that it continues, dear Lord, like to ask you to continue to be with us as well as those that are on the road traveling to church and those for some reason who could not make it all these things we ask in your name amen you may be seated now a call to worship once again i should have said this standing if you would stand once again for a call to worship call to worship is on in your bulletin and it's also on the screen
people? You don't have to stand up. Okay, let us uh, recite our call to worship. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. On this Sabbath day, we should remember that Christ is our creator, he is our deliverer, and he is our savior. Amen. You may be seated. Now, our hymn of worship. Our hymn of worship can be found on page 86. It's called How Great Thou Art.
be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> right now is the time in the service where we return. Excuse me. Right now, where we return unto God, what is his, what is His? Some people like to say, "Give tithe and offerings." You're not giving. How can you give something to somebody it already belongs to? We are returning what's His. You keep it at me. I've had a friend who told me, I can't go to church because I don't have enough money to give. I looked at him and I said, you can't not afford not to go to church. I said, it's not giving. He just went on and on about pastors driving this, living here, living there. I said, look, I said, the Bible says return a tenth. I said, what is done after that is out of your control. I said, stop looking at television, looking at <laughs> some people, how they live, where they drive. I said, don't pay attention. Focus on God. You're focusing on man. We also talked about the day in Sabbath school. We also focused on God can take a little and make much. So despite what we give, God is going to multiply it and, and do what he needs to be done. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I'd like to thank you for these funds that we have returned unto you, dear Lord. They were yours from the beginning. You just asked us to be obedient. I pray, dear Lord, that you take these tithes and offerings, dear Lord, that you multiply them, that you have them sent to where they need to go to help further the spread of the gospel. Ultimately, when that is done, dear Lord, you be glorified in all of these things. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. Now, I know the screen says intercessory prayer, and I know you guys have heard me harp on the definition, and I'm going to continue. Intercessory prayer, the word intercessor means to stand in the gap for someone. If we know of someone, rather they... It, even if they have not spoken it to you, but if you know someone that's going through a trying time that needs prayer, our job as Christians, we're supposed to stand in the gap for that individual. I know some of you will know this firsthand, that when trials hit you, you can't think straight. We should, but we, we, we have a tendency to let, and I'm, I'm no different, so I'm, I'm including myself in that. When trials sometimes come up, we let our trials be too big, bigger than God. So other people are going through things right now. Our job is to stand in the gap for them. Even though we need prayer for things, we should stand in the gap for those people that we know that truly needs help with that being said if you have a prayer request testimony or praise report if you raise your hand the mic will be brought to you where you can share it with the church okay janice is coming
Good morning, everyone. I left home this morning, and nobody probably leaves it, but I left home this morning at about 9 o'clock. I'm never up at 9 o'clock in the morning for on Sabbath morning. I mean, I'm never out of the house by that time, but I wanted to pick up new members this morning and bring them to church for a uh, new members Sabbath school class. I'd have them here. I, they actually would have been here probably about quarter after nine. But when I got to their home, before I could call them, I wasn't going to rush them. I was going to sit out in the driveway and just wait patiently on them. But before, as soon as I got there, my phone rang and I said, oh, I wasn't going to rush you. She said, what you mean, you outside? I said, yes, I am, but don't rush. Just take your time. And she said, but I was calling you to tell you I wasn't coming. And she sounded very sad. And I said, what's wrong? She said, well, I don't want to talk about it right now. I'll talk to you later about it. I'm not going. And they were just baptized last week, and I was so sad. She said, I'll tell you later about it. Something happened that prevented them from desiring to come to church today, both mother and daughter. Uh, so I would like for you to pray for Spray and her, her mother, um, Tanya. And, and these are two people who I had not even spoken to about. They were people who I had been going to to give Bible studies, but every time I'd take them to studies, they would say, we haven't had time, we've just been too busy uh, to do the studies, but I would never stop going to them. And, and so they just would ride with me. I'd take them to the store. I was just kind to them and do things for them. And, and just from that contact with them, they decided they wanted to be baptized. And then after their first week of being new members, they're not at church today. And so I was very sad. So please pray for Tanya and Sabre that God will bless them and whatever's going on in their lives that he will heal that we know that satan is busy i know he has been in my life and and just seemed like he double duty on me i mean like he just he just he just made me his special project so pray for them especially and pray that god will strengthen me and my faith and and also pray for um Lawrence uh, Bays, he's here today, that God will continue to lead and guide him. He's already, he already knows the word and he had the Sabbath explained to him and, and, and God's word this morning. So continue to pray for him and others who God has planted the seed in as we go out doing the Bible studies and uh, bless Sister Valerie because she's been a trooper and keep her as she inspires me. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? I know uh, right over here. You might as well walk over there, Earl. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to say that I, I, want, I want to thank God for, for being here. I, I thank God for uh, letting Sister Janice and the uh, young lady uh, knock on the wrong door. <laughs> but for me, that was uh, 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 no one to me that God was speaking to me. Uh, they not at the wrong door. They at the right door. It was the wrong door physically, but spiritually, it was the right door. And I, and I, I thank God for the uh, uh, I'm really the pastor of the elder there. Elder Aaron, Elder Aaron, I thank God for Elder Aaron for explaining uh, what I asked him today so beautifully. Never heard of that term, never heard of that expression, but he did a beautiful job in explaining the thing. Thank God I see the love, I see the love of Christ in this church. It's inspired me. My heart is falling apart, you know. So I called Sister Janice just today. I said, Sister James, I said, um, make a day for me to get baptized next on next week. So that's what I want to do, get baptized on next week. On uh, January, um, on November, on uh, December the 4th coming up, 
I have to be in the hospital uh, for cancer. So that's coming up. Pray for me, my strength. We definitely do that. And um, just to just to say this, there's not a lot of people here, but those that are here, you will feel the love. Trust me. I can tell you this. You will continue to feel the love. It's not just a one-time thing. You will feel the love every time you walk through that door. Give it honor to God. Every time I come to church, somebody's got cancer. Ever since I found out that my son had cancer, he caught cancer earlier this year. Ever since I found that out, everybody, everybody looked like everybody, every young man I meet almost, trying to serve the Lord, got cancer. And I just want to pray for you. It's going to be okay. I wish my son had come. Some days he feels good and some, some days he doesn't. But I, I want you to meet him. He's, a, I want to say, an epitome of strength, and he's laying in the bed right now. But he, he, it can work out. It's going to work out because he's doing so well. But I want to give honor to God because I have my health and strength. The roof in my house fell down from the inside, but everything is going to be fine. I can remember when I would have I would have been down there laying on the floor with all the stuff. But I am really encouraged. I got the strength to go on and I thank God. I just looked and I said, it's going to be all right. It's going to be God's got it. And I know he does the same way he has you. And I just want you to pray my strength in the Lord because I am a better person since I've been in this church. I'm a very much better person. <laughs> I can get here sometimes almost on time, but I, I, I'm doing better. And i just like to thank the Lord for this church, the pastor, the members, and the guests, the people that are here now. Thank you. And the musician. Yep. <laughs> Amen. And he cannot speak for himself, but I'd like, to, like, like for us to pray for Elder Earl. He's having trouble with his voice, so let's keep him in prayer as well that he regains his voice by this afternoon. <laughs> Anyone else with prayer request, testimony, or praise report? Yeah. Okay, with that being said, let us, to the best of our abilities, assume a posture of prayer. So while the music is playing, I'm going to invite Brother Lawrence down to the altar. And the Holy Spirit is leading me to do something on behalf of Pastor Jenkins. I want you to stand right there because his brother just stated that he had cancer. The Bible says, if anyone among you, this is James 513, we're going to take God at his word. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. If anyone cheerful, let him sing songs. If anyone among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So I'm going to invite Elder Reno up as well. We're going to anoint you, my brother. We're going to pray over you, and we're going to have a prayer for everybody else as well. We're going to lay our hands on them. Our most gracious, kind, heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you on behalf of your servant, Brother Lawrence Jesus. Lord God, we just read your word, Lord. And in your word, Lord, you says, 
With man, things are impossible. With, with God, all things are possible. So, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, with, with outstretched arms, taking you at your word, we pray right now as I'm praying for healing for Brother Lawrence. We pray that you will heal him of cancer, eradicate it. When he goes to the doctor, they'll say he has no cancer and he'll get discharged. Lord God, we thank you for him making this commitment of giving his life to you, Lord, for him accepting your truths, Lord. Lord, we thank you for Sister Janice, Lord God, Sister Val, who knocked on his door, led by the Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for everybody who you drew today here. Sister Janice, her knees, her body, Lord. Lord, we pray for Prince's father, that you bless him and continue to work in his life. We pray for Prince's grandmother, our physician. We pray for all of our members here today, Lord. If I forgot their name, Lord, we know that you know their names, Lord, and that their names are written in the book of life. Lord God, we thank you so much for bringing us to another Sabbath, Lord. Allow us as you speak today, Lord. Allow us to experience your love, Lord, but not just your love. Allow us to be filled with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that our calling and election will be sure. We will be solidified, Lord, in, 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 in you, Lord. And when we leave this place today, we will leave in a way, Lord, that we've never left before, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus for Brother Earl's voice. I pray as I'm, I am speaking, I pray that he talks, Lord. <laughs> Lord, I'm excited, Lord. This, this, this word is just so exciting how, how we can just believe on your promises and just stay right there, Lord. <laughs> so, Lord, if there's anybody else, Lord, that needs you, if there's anybody else on the Zoom that's going through things, if, if there's anybody else that will watch this later that is going through things, Lord, Lord, we pray that you have your way in their lives, Lord. Lord, we thank you, praise you, and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Wow. That shows that the Holy Spirit moves because that was not something that was scripted. That was not something that we talked about. That was not something planned. That's just the elder being led by the Holy Spirit and obeying. Now it'll be time for our scripture reading. Our scripture today comes from the book of John, chapter 15, and verse 15, I mean 16. That's John 15, 16. Let us stand for the reading of God's holy word. Let us read together. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that ye shall go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit shall remain, that wherever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the hearing, reading, and understanding of his word. You may be seated.
Shall we pray? Our most gracious, kind, heavenly Father, Lord. Lord, I thank you for another day of life. Lord, I thank you for choosing us. Lord, I thank you for the love, Lord, that you share each and every day, Lord. Lord, it is without that love, Lord, that we will not be able to survive or make it, or we will be able to be more like you, Lord. Today, I pray that I decrease and you increase. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's so good for me to be back with you another week. I'm actually excited to be back with you for the rest of this month. Um, as I think about this privilege, my brothers and sisters, I um, love checking in with my wife. And in checking in with my wife as a husband, I always want to know if I'm meeting the mark. I always want to know if she really loves me, if she, if she chose to love me. The reason why this is so important, my brothers and sisters, because when I think about relationships, right, the world says that a man wants to be need, needed. But the Bible tells me that a man truly wants to be wanted. Like a man wants to be chosen. I want to ask you a question today. What is the most important in your love relationship? To be wanted or to be needed? See, my brothers and sisters, to be wanted is to be chosen. And to be needed is to be loved out of lack. Wanted is being loved completely, but being needed is being loved incompletely. I'm going to draw your mind to Daniel chapter 10. And I'm going to demonstrate the difference between a want and a need. Here we have Daniel, who has been given this vision in Daniel chapter 10. And as a result of Daniel receiving this vision, he um, starts to get this insatiable need. God shows him something in the future, and he qu doesn't quite understand it. And he's troubled in his spirit, and he's, he, he, he has this insatiable need. And the beautiful thing about Daniel is, is Daniel took his need to Jesus. See, my brothers and sisters, we all have needs that cannot be fulfilled in humans. We have to take our needs to Jesus, the desire of all ages. And the Bible says in Daniel 10, verses 10 through 12, listen to these words. Suddenly, a hand touched me which made me tremble on my knees and on the palm of my hands. Watch this, y'all. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man, greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And while he was speaking, this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel. From the first day that you set your heart to understand, to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your word. My brothers and sisters, you're wanted today. You're wanted. You've been praying. You've been searching. You've been having this need that you've been trying to fulfill in drugs. You've had this need that you have been trying to fulfill in entertainment. You have this need that you have been trying to get fulfilled in your secret sin. But God is saying today, as you have been on your knees this week, as you have been pleading with Jesus, he taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, Sister Janice. Oh, woman of God, you are greatly beloved. Stand upright, for I have been sent to you. Because when you first had that need, the God of heaven sent me to you. Next slide. The reason why Jesus does this, my brothers and sisters, James 1.18 tells us that you are the apple of God's eye. Of his own will, begot he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first 
fruits of his creatures. What the Bible is telling us, God made a conscientious choice to use himself to speak us into existence. And not only did he speak us into existence, he said, you're going to be the head and not the tail. You're going to be a lender and not a borrower. Next slide. And the reason why, now this is not just a gospel for just anybody. The Bible tells me, for many are called, but few are chosen. The Bible says in John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. Now watch this. The Bible is saying in this scripture, and I'm going to unpack it. You did not choose to love me, but I chose to love you and I appointed you that you should go forth and bear love. And that your love should remain that whatever you ask the father in my name. He will give it to you. See, my brothers and sisters, when, 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 a truly, when, a, when the love of God truly is what you want, it would already satisfy your needs. Because, may, because my brothers and sisters, you, you really don't know what you need. You know what you think you want, but you don't know what you need. But see, when you choose to choose Jesus, Jesus will not only give you what you want, but he'll also supply your needs. <laughs> Next slide. First John chapter 14, 17 through 19 says it this way. I was thinking about this verse because when we think about this Hurricane Milton that just came, right? This Hurricane Milton caused a lot of people to have fear. But if we read John 15, 16, for those who were chosen to bear God's love, we should have been on our knees demonstrating this scripture. It says, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of a hurricane. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Do you remember when the disciples were told to go to the other side of the lake and there was a storm? What did Jesus do while they were in the storm? Jesus, in this verse, went to them. Remember, he was up in the mountain to pray, and then he, he came down out of the mountain. They were a little bit afar, and he was walking on the water, and Peter said, Lord, is, is that you? They thought he was a ghost. What I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, is Jesus doesn't leave us in the storm. Jesus walks to us in the storm. And what the scripture is saying is for those who have the love of Christ in them, they will not fear because there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. As I was sitting on the bed talking to my wife and I was asking her, babe, do you love me? She looked at me crazy and said, yeah, I love you. I said, babe, do you love me? She said, Aaron, you know I love you. I said, babe, do you love me? And she said, yes, Aaron, I choose to love you. And that changed my heart because my brothers and sisters today, you are wanted because God chooses to love you. And the only way you can love from want, the only way you can make a choice to love is if you have the love of Christ in you. If you try to make love from need, it'll be an insufficient love. It will be a transactional love. Because needing to love somebody comes with strings attached. But wanting some, to love somebody doesn't come with any strings attached. Next slide. As we look at this text of John 6, before in the book of John, it opens up with Jesus doing the greatest miracle. We talked about this miracle earlier in Sabbath school. And it was Jesus feeding the 5,000 plus. And as Jesus fed these 5,000, he, at that point, was in the ship with the disciples on the boat. He told the, the wind and the waves to be still. 
And then when they went to the other side, these same individuals he fed came looking for him. And they was looking for him and they was like, Lord, like, where are you? And he spoke to them and said, you didn't come looking for me because I did the miracle. You came looking for me because you have a need. There is something in you that hungers for me. And I stand here today, my brothers and sisters, you didn't show up to church because you came on your own volition. You showed up to church today because you had a need that could only be fulfilled in Jesus. The Bible says in John 6, 35 through 40, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. What Jesus is speaking here is Jesus is speaking about himself. He's speaking about his body. He's speaking about his blood. But then he gives them a qualifier. He says, but I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. There is a hunger and thirst inside of you that can only be satisfied if you believe. All the father giveth me shall come to me and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the father's will, which has sent me that all which he has given me, I shall lose nothing, but shall raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. My brothers and sisters, when I think about this text and I think about what is trying to be uh, taught here, is God has a desire to do the greatest miracle in your life, which is saving. God doesn't care about all the insignificant things. He, he doesn't care about the emotion. What God cares about is God cares about sharing with you his heart. And God's heart is that you be with him for eternity. Hmm. Next slide. Now, what God does when, when he invites you in because you're hungering and you're thirsting and you've been reading and searching, but you still hasn't, haven't gotten that satisfaction that you need because... My brothers and sisters, he says at that particular point, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So, so what God is saying is, is your knowledge, your head knowledge of the scriptures have, have led you to being burdened. You're trying to keep these expectations of the church, these expectations of holiness, but you truly encounter Jesus and Jesus says, look, we got to have a transaction. You can no longer do anything in your intellect, but you got to do everything from your heart. And what I'm going to do is, is at this verse, we're going to have a transaction. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take what you have done. I'm going to tell you to rest. I'm going to give you my life and my ways. And then I'm going to lighten your burden. When you meet me, it's no longer going to be about form or fashion or rules and regulations, but it's going to be about a love relationship with me. And as you build your love relationship with me, watch, this is who Jesus, this is what Jesus does for you. What Jesus does when you come to him is he gives you a guide. Next slide. Watch this. The Bible says in John 16, 7 through 11, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. That's Jesus, our Savior. He's just telling the people that I'm going to give you bread, but now he's saying it's, it's for your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Now, this is so beautiful. If Jesus, our creator, gets out of the way, 
why don't you get out of the way? <laughs> we think this gospel depends and ends with us. You, we think if we don't go out, that people ain't going to come in. The devil is a liar. That's not your work. That is the spirit's work. That is the helper's work. Why is that the helper's work? It says, and when he has come, some say, say helper for me. The helper will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me of righteousness because I go to the to my father and you see me no more of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged my brothers and sisters listen to this you will not even know that you're a sinner if the Holy Spirit didn't tell you you was a sinner I have no qualifications to tell you about your sin. Why? Because I have a plank in my eye. And the reason why we need the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit says, listen, you're doing wrong. That little small voice in your head that says, stop that. That's going to hurt you. Like that's going to lead you to a road of destruction. Why? Because the only way that we know to do right is by the Holy Spirit teaching us. But see, the Holy Spirit teaches you because the Holy Spirit says, listen, you will be held accountable for what you do. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. I, the Lord, try the heart and reward every man for the fruit of his doing. And my brothers and sisters, this is why it's so beautiful. You know what? Hell wasn't even made for you. Let me say it to you this way. Hell wasn't even reserved for you. The Bible tells me that hell was made for what? Come on, y'all. The ruler of this world. Let's go. Now watch this. How do we operate, my brothers and sisters? The Bible says, next slide, in Zechariah 4, 6, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. This is the word of the Lord to you, Sister Val. This is the word of the Lord to you, Brother Earl. Not by your voice, nor by your knowledge. <laughs> but by my spirit, says the Lord. Isn't that amazing that we can be imperfect and God's spirit can come in and make my crazy words sound intelligent <sighs> come on next slide now after you get your helper everybody say helper all right so you meet your helper you meet jesus jesus tells you he chose you he says i picked you out i love you with no strings attached and not only are these strings not attached but I'm going to satisfy all of your wants and needs. You sacrifice what you want while forsaking what you need because the devil tricked you. He got you to be so discontent that you are blind to everything you need. You're blind to everything that God gave you, seeking something that the devil promised you, the mirage. And as you seek this mirage, what you realize is you've given up everything that God has given you. If you don't believe me, read Genesis 3. Eve and Adam had everything they needed. What did the devil say to them? On this tree, what, what, what's on this tree? will give you something that you need. Well, not what you need, but it'll give you something that you want. It'll give you knowledge of good and evil. Don't you want knowledge of good and evil? And God is saying, uh-uh. Every tree in this garden I've given you to eat from. You don't have a need for that one. But this one, I don't want you to touch it. Because if you touch it, you'll die. Now, this is what the helper does, my brothers and sisters. It says, but as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered in the heart of men the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Brother Lawrence, because you made a decision 
to give your life to Jesus Christ, to get baptized, there are things that you haven't seen, there are things that you haven't heard, and there are things that have not entered in your heart that the Lord has prepared for you. Oh. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. That's why you cannot read the word of God with head knowledge. For the spirit search of all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. If you were to ask me how to answer your question today and I gave you my opinion, I would uh, encourage you to get up and walk out of this church. Because my brother and sister, what people do when you ask them about the gospel truth, they give you their opinion. They give you their interpretation. But what we did, the Bible says, go line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. And what the Holy Spirit will do with that is he will lead you. And watch this. It says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God that we may know the things that are freely given to us. When the enemy offered Eve something that wasn't his, it came with strings attached. What Jesus had already given them came with no strings attached. Next slide. This is, this is the kick of my brothers and sisters. You are sinners saved by grace. And what happens is, it says in Romans 5, 15, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abound to many. So we had our forefather, Adam and Eve, make a decision to sin, to disobey God. And as a result of his disobedience, sin came into the world. But sin was not the only thing that came into the world. The Bible tells me that when sin came into the world, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, came into the world. What the Bible is saying is you cannot out sin God's grace. This is important, my brothers and sisters, because there are some that have given their lives to Christ last week, and there are some here that may want to grow in their relationship with Christ, and they may have done some things this week. I want to let you know that you are wanted. Next slide. As you receive that grace, and as that grace abounds, this is the beautiful thing about grace, my brothers and sisters. People teach a presumptuous grace. They teach a grace that excuses you from your disobedience. But this is what grace, the grace of God does. Titus 2, 11 and 12 says, for the grace of God bringeth salvation, hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live what? Soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What the helper does is the helper comes and the helper takes you deeper into God's word. And as the helper takes you deeper into God's word, the helper gives you power. John 1 chapter 12 says, but as many as received him, he gave power to those who believe. Watch this, y'all. Next slide. Watch this. I want you to look at how this, this is built up. You may not be able to see it, but I'm going to read it to you. Listen to how the Holy Spirit puts one thing in, in front of the next thing in front of the next thing. Watch this. Ephesians 2, chapter 4 through 10. One of his favorite verses of how we're saved. The Bible says this. It says in Ephesians 2, verses 4. Watch this, y'all. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us okay so so when god gives you his grace he gives you his holy spirit you realize how rich his love is 
you realize how much you don't deserve his love. When you realize how much you don't deserve his love, guess what the scripture says in verse 5? Even when we were dead in sins, how many people were in a situation where they should have been dead? I might not even be talking about physically dead, but spiritually dead. How many times have you been depressed, wanted to give up? The Bible says when you were dead in your sins, when you were in sins and addictions that you didn't believe that you can get up out of, God's grace showed up and quickened us together with Christ. By grace, we are saved. Now, watch this. Not only does it quicken us, verse 6, it says, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places together in, Je in Christ Jesus. Do you know why Jesus had to leave? Do you know why it was an advantage for Jesus to leave? Because Jesus was going to heavenly places. Jesus was going to heaven to prepare a place for you. And he did not leave you to yourself. He left you with a helper. He says, I got to go to heaven. I got to get your, your mansion ready. I got to get your seat next to the throne ready. And guess what? When I come to you in your sins, when you supposed to be dead, when I come to you, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull you up out of your sin because I love you. And as I pull you up out of your sins, not only am I going, am I going to pull you up out of your sins, but I'm going to make you alive. I'm going to make you live again. I'm going to make you go to church again. I'm going to heal you again. And not only am I going to heal you, I'm going to keep your eyes on heavenly places. Because I have a, I have a reserved seat with your name on it. And as he gives us our reserved seat, y'all, this is what happens. That in ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ. See, the God the same yesterday and forevermore, the same today, yesterday and forevermore, loves the same today, yesterday and forevermore. And as we love today, yesterday, and forevermore, not only will this impact you, but it'll impact your third generation, your fourth generation, and generations to come. The same God that delivered you out of your sin of affliction is going to change the trajectory of your family. Look at Prince Grandmama. She got baptized. And as a result of her getting baptized, a couple years later, her grandson got baptized. That is generational grace. Y'all, I'm not telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what I know. Y'all sitting there too calm for me, but it's okay. You'll get excited in a minute. For by grace ye are saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Brothers and sisters, as, as we understand the grace of God and as we're walking in his grace and his love, it just doesn't stop there. You come to Christ, Christ goes to heaven, prepares your home for you, he sends you a helper. And as God sends you this helper, he tells you, this is how I saved you. My grace, I transform you. Not only you, but all of your generations. Not only your generations. Don't boast about it. Don't brag about it. Because this is not by your might or your power. It, give me the credit, right? And if you give me the credit, I'm going to keep allowing you to do the work. But as God allows you to do the work, this is the next phase. Next slide. What happens, my brother, is there a war, there's a war going on. Anybody who tells you that there is not a cosmic conflict is deceiving you and deceiving themselves. The Bible says, or, or this statement, and I'll give you Bible in the next slide, the spirit versus the flesh. If you feed the flesh, you starve the spirit. If you starve the flesh, you feed the spirit. You can either live by the flesh or you can live by the spirit. Next slide. Let me give you Bible for this. The Bible tells us in Galatians 5, 17, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit 
and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in what? Come on. Conflict with each other. So that you are not to do what? Whatever you want to do. My kids, I talk to them about that all the time. They want to drink soda. And I have to tell them, you can't drink soda. You know what they say? Oh, why do you get to drink soda? And I tell them I'm mature enough to handle the sugar that comes with it. When you're mature enough to handle what God has given you, it's not for you to do whatever you want to do. I have to remind them, me drinking soda is not me doing whatever I want to do. It's doing what I'm mature enough to handle and do. My brothers and sisters, what I'm telling you right now is if we don't mature by the spirit, we will be doing whatever we want to do. We will think that we're doing what God wants us to do, but we're only doing what we want to do. But when we mature in Christ, we're able to do what Christ wants us to do. Next slide. Now, this is the war that's going on in each and every one of us battle with. Galatians tells us the war between the flesh and the spirit. And in Galatians chapter 5, a few verses down, it tells us, now the works of the flesh are manifest with these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedations, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness. These are all the things that the spirit can give you the victory over. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Now watch this. Next slide. My brothers and sisters, this is what I learned about sin. Sin is not sin until you yield. Sin is not sin until you yield. Now, don't play with it. Take heed. Because if you think you stand, at least you fall. The Bible tells us now, because I'm, I'm, I'm walking, I'm, I'm trying to teach us how to fight against the flesh. How to, instead of yielding to your anger, your frustration, your anxiety, your appetite, I'm trying to help you yield to the spirit. Now, the Bible tells us in Romans 6, 16, know ye not to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey. His servants are ye to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you become a slave to sin, you're going to die. But if you become a slave to righteousness, you're going to live. Next slide. This is how we deal with the temptation, my brother and sister. This is how temptation occurs. Because temptation, the definition of temptation is evil represented as good. You with me? Evil represented as good is how we tempt. Okay? The Bible says in James 1, 12 through 18, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. When you make a godly choice, you're choosing to love God over loving your desire. Now, when you choose to love God over your desire, then God has a reward. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil Neither tempteth he any man, but every man, this is, this is accountability. Stop blaming the devil. You're giving the devil too much credit, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust have, has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and when sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights 
with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. What the Bible is saying is God cannot tempt you because God is all good. And a God who is only good can't become evil and then present himself as good. That don't make sense. What, what the Bible is saying is take accountability for what you think. Take accountability for what's in your heart. I want you to go home today and take an inventory of your heart in the mirror. Write down all of your desires. And when you write down those desires, go to God and say, God, I choose you. I surrender my desires to you. Let me give you scripture. This is why you should surrender your desires. Next slide. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there has no temptation taking you, but as common to man. Now, if the temptation comes by evil, represented as good, if the temptation comes by the devil, what God is saying is the devil cannot take advantage of you. The devil cannot tempt you beyond your own consent. He cannot get you to do anything beyond your will. That is a principle that God has put in the universe. The devil can only tempt those he deceives. He can't force us to do anything. Now watch this. But God is faithful. You know why this scripture can be written? Because when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he, he, he overcame the temptations of the devil. What this is saying is because Christ overcame, so can you overcome. The victory, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a victory gospel. It's not a victim gospel. Only victims yield and then blame others. Victors surrender to God and they claim his promises. Who will not suffer you to be attempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Isn't it amazing that God gives us a power, his love in us? Next slide. I want to show you why we're able to bear this temptation. Listen to this, y'all. In 2 Corinthians 5.14, it says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, we are all dead. So if Christ truly died for my sins, then that, that desire that I have, I'm dead to it. Stay with me. I'm going to show you how this happens. Now, Paul has, next slide, <clears throat> In Ministry of Healing, page 500, listen to what Paul says about the cross. He says, the love of Christ, said Paul, constraineth us, meaning compels us. This was the actuating principle of his conduct. <clears throat> it was his motive. If ever his ardor in the path of duty flagged for a moment, listen to this, one glance at the cross caused him to gird up anew the loins of his mind and press forward in the way of self-denial. In his labors for his brethren, he relied much upon the manifestation of infinite love in the sacrifice of Christ with its subduing and constraining power. Brothers and sisters, next slide. <clears throat> Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Listen to what Paul is saying. Next slide. Romans 14.7-9 says this, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. For whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live together or die, we are the Lord's. For, this, for to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord of both living and the dead. Brothers and sisters, watch this. Anytime you're about to fall, Anytime you have a sin in you that feels like it's about to overtake you, what Paul did when he was about to be less than his best is he looked at the cross. And as Paul was angry and he was frustrated, 
he, he saw the cross, the cross where I first saw the light. And this burden that I'm carrying of anger rolls away. It is there by faith that I, that I see my sight. And, and, and now I am happy all the day. So, so what Paul said is anytime you get frustrated or angry, it's the cross. Anytime you feel overwhelmed by looking at a woman, it's the cross. Anytime you have this addictive behavior, thought in your mind, turn to the cross. And the cross with its subduing, constraining power changes your heart. Why? Because you know that the love that Christ had for you. You know that Christ wanted you when nobody else wanted you. You know that Christ loved you when nobody else loved you. When, no, when they talked about you and rejected you and disappointed you and let your expectations down, you look to the cross and cross said, and, and Jesus said, hey, come here. I want you. Come, me? But I'm a sinner, Lord. Okay, watch this. Let me show you something. See my hands. See my feet. See my heart. And when you see that, the love of Christ just resonates in your mind and the love of Christ overtakes you. And as, as you look at the cross, my brothers and sisters, can I be honest with y'all? Next slide. Everybody don't love the cross. They don't. There's two things that we got to be aware of. Willful ignorance and innocent ignorance. The Pharisees and Sadducees had willful ignorance. They saw Jesus. They saw him do miracles. The miracles that he did was the miracles that were already done with Moses in the Bible. The same things that they memorized in the Bible from a head perspective, they missed from a heart perspective because they had willful ignorance. The Bible tells us in James 14, 17, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does it not, to him is a sin. I didn't say that. The word of God said it. So my brothers and sisters, there is innocent ignorance. There are people who are not quite mature in their journey and they are, are, are honestly in faith and in church. And as they're in church, they have a desire for God, an honest desire for God, but it's still some things that they just quite don't understand or it's still some things that they can't understand. The Bible tells me in Acts 17, 30, truly these times of ignorance, God overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man who he has ordained. He has given assurance to this by raising him from the dead. He has given us blessed, not insurance, but blessed assurance. See, those people in Milton who lost their homes in Florida, we need to tell them not about insurance. We need to tell them about the blessed assurance. Next slide. This is what, happened when you're, this is what happens when you're willfully ignorant. It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So that helper that God sends you when he goes to prepare a place for you, you know what you tell that, that helper? I don't need your help. And not only do you tell that helper you don't need no help, you reject the helper. You break the heart of the helper. You make the Holy Spirit grieve. You make the Holy Spirit, when they see you, look at you and say, oh, my goodness. They just so stubborn and so hateful and so angry. And the Holy Spirit says, because God is such a gentleman, I will not do what you won't allow me to do. If, if, if you don't want my help, I will leave you to your own devices. The Bible talks about this in Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 1. It talks about a reprobate mind. Where the Holy Spirit comes to you and comes to you and you reject him and you reject him. He says, okay, I'll leave you alone. And then he leaves you alone. This is the danger, my brothers and sisters, of looking at the cross, not accepting the cross, looking down on the cross. Next slide. It says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened 
and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. So once you accepted the Holy Spirit, you're walking with Jesus, you're proclaiming the gospel in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. And then for whatever reason, because your heart is not truly repentant, because you're not converted, something happens in your life and you just let the Holy Spirit go. You just look at the cross and you believe that the power of your sin is greater than the power of the cross. There are people in this world that believes that the power of their addiction is greater than the power of the cross. Next slide. This is my encouragement for you, my brothers and sisters. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. See, when, when Christ saves you and he takes away that addiction, you no longer have to head. You no longer have to walk like you used to be an alcoholic. You can walk as if you were never an alcoholic. See, 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 you can be a, addicted to drugs and, and you can be freed from drugs. You shouldn't walk timidly because you're afraid of drugs. You should walk boldly surrendered every day to God and stand fast and remind yourself, God made me free. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not a drug addict. I'm not a liar. I've been called to freedom in Christ. And it says, do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. When God calls you in Matthew 11, it says, come unto me, all who are labor. He took off the yoke of your bondage. So what you tell Jesus when you go back to your vomit, what you tell Jesus is, Jesus, take your yoke back and give me my yoke. Next slide. My brothers and sisters, this is, this is a beautiful story. And what Jesus is saying, we're building a spiritual life. And what Jesus was telling to the disciples, it, it was a story before we got to these texts about a wedding feast. And the guy in the wedding feast was going out. He was calling people to come to the wedding. He's like, you come. You come, and, and, and he, he went to another person. He's like, no, I just got a new, new cow. I ain't going to come. I just got married. I'm not going to come. I got something to do. I got a new job. I, I'm not going to come. And Jesus says something in these verses that were profound. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, and children, brothers, and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So what Jesus is saying, he's not talking about a hate. He's talking about if you don't love me more than anything else in this world, then you can't follow me. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The reason why we can bear our cross because he bore his cross. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first? And count to cost whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation, is not able to finish. All who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make a war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able to with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and acts conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all, he cannot be my disciples. My brothers and sisters, listen to this text. This is what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us today. When Jesus said that he was going to save you from your sins, he considered the cost. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit sat down in the council of peace. And they were talking about your life. And they said, how much does this life cost? He told the Son, it costs your life. The Son said to the Father, I'll pay it. 
the Holy Spirit showed up and said, I'll keep them. So my brothers and sisters, what the scripture is saying, Jesus considered the cost so you wouldn't be lost. The issue is without the Holy Spirit, we cannot consider the cost. Because anytime we're indebted in sin and the enemy comes up and says, you're a sinner. We can look at the enemy and say, I am a sinner saved by grace. Though I'm in debt, my account is settled at the cross. So when they try to put him to shame, Jesus shows up and says, hey, man, what you doing with what you doing with, uh, with Press Brown Mama? What you doing with her? Well, I'm t- she, she don't fell off the porch. It's okay. She can fall. Next slide. Because if she falls, this is what's going to happen. Don't ever give up. Look. God doesn't give up on us. We give up on God. The Bible says, for a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again. But the wicked shall fall into calamity. As as I come to a close, my brothers and sisters, this is what I want to let you know. I want to let you know, right now, you have made a decision to give your life to Christ. And as a result of making a decision to give your life to Christ, you have begun this journey with Jesus. This organic relationship with Jesus. And beginning this organic relationship with Jesus, Jesus says, hey, I love you. Like, I want you. And as Jesus receives you, he says to you, not only do I want you, but my father is the one that chose you. My father is the one that pulled you out of the muck and mire and pointed you to me. Now come. So you begin your walk with Jesus. And as you begin in your walk with Jesus and you're walking and you're saying, Lord, this is a lot. Like, like the gospel is under, hard to understand. Like, I don't understand what it means, what the cross truly means. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus says to you, hey, hold on right there. I got to go. But if I go, I'm going to send you a helper. Like, like, I still have some things to continue to do on your behalf. I have to go to heaven. And there has to be an investigation that takes place. And in this investigation, when your name comes up, because you have the helper, which is the Holy Spirit, who has been walking with you and talking with you and believing with you, when your name comes up on the road, when my father looks at your record, I'm going to intercede for you and advocate for you. And as I'm advocating for you, and we look at your record, and we're looking at your sins, and we're looking at your decisions, we don't see any sins. We don't see what you used to be. All the Father sees on your record is Jesus' life. Because when you came to Jesus, you took his yoke for your yoke. You had the Holy Spirit teaching you to go deeper and deeper. And when you were about to fall, Holy Spirit was like, get back up. He got back up. He gave you repentance. He dusted you off. And he says, go and sin no more. Next slide. My brothers and sisters, as we close, what I want to let you know today, therefore he is able to say to the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I don't know where you are right now in your life. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know if you feel overwhelmed. You keep falling and getting back up, falling and getting back up. But what I want to let you know, when your case comes before God, you have an advocate that has a 100% victory rate. <laughs> the Bible tells us when you come to God, man, when you come to him and, 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 and you give him your heart and he's pleading your case, it says victor. As we stand to our feet, my brothers and sisters, I don't know what you've been through this week. Uh, 
we've had a phenomenal time, and we're going to continue to have a phenomenal time in the month of October. And as the spirit is moving, my first appeal is if you have been straying and falling and you want to come down for special prayer, I want to invite you down for special prayer. Because my brothers and sisters, whatever you're going through, the Holy Spirit is drawing you and he's saying, listen, you don't have to stay stuck in this. You don't have to stay stuck in this. Come unto me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give them rest. My brother and sister, the second appeal I have is if there's anybody here that wants to give their life to Christ, if you have been overwhelmed with the cares of this world and you're like, I'm done, I want to give it to you. We want to invite you down so we can pray over you. Our most gracious, kind Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word today. We thank you so much that you wanted us, Lord. Lord God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus for any heart in here that has going through something that just didn't come down, but they still need prayer. Lord, I pray for them right now. Lord, I pray for my brother, Brother Lawrence, as he has made his decision to give his life to Christ and baptism, Lord. Lord, I pray now as you continue to keep him next week and for the rest of his life, Lord. Lord, I am looking forward to the report of healed from cancer. <laughs> Lord, more than healing him, if it's your will, Lord, we know that you can save him. We know that you can save him, Lord. So, Lord, if there's anybody on Zoom or if there's anybody else that hears this message later, Lord, and they want to give their lives to Christ, Lord, Please help them to get into a church somewhere. Please help them not to be made, but trust you, believe in your promises, Lord, while you're in this. Lord, we love you. We praise you and we honor you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Elder Aaron, for allowing the Lord to use you. Amen. Now, I can speak for myself. Sometimes we need reminders. From the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, it's nothing but reminders. And sometimes we need people to nudge us, or in my case, sometimes kick us to remind us of <laughs> his grace and what he has done for us and what he is able to do for us. Thank you once again, Elder, for allowing the Lord to use you. Let us stand for our benediction, which is Jude 1, 24, 25, 24 and 25. It can be found in your bulletin and on the screen. Let us uh, recite. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Before, you, before you're seated, let us pray for the food downstairs. We've had spiritual food. <laughs> now let's go stairs for physical food. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I'd like to thank you for allowing us to feast on your word, dear Lord. I pray, dear Lord, that you continue to be with us. And as we depart to go downstairs to feast on physical food, dear Lord, I pray that the food be used to nourish all these bodies, dear Lord. Bless those that are less fortunate. All these things we pray in 